from Yangon. Tell me what that song was about. The song is about the, the, the life of the villagers and uh, about also like comparing in village life with the city life. And this one was very famous and uh, composed by Ngita Tao and uh, performed, uh, originally performed by Kimaoni, one of the most famous uh, film actor and singer. Hey everybody, welcome to Sama. I'm Derek Mazzoni. Sama is based in Seattle. Um, I have been following Myanmar um, for many, many years, not just from a, uh, a political, socioeconomical perspective, but from a perspective of music. So today we have with us Ni Mio Awong. He's a uh, Sandaya player, which is a Burmese piano, it's an upright piano. He's a Fulbright recipient with an MA in ethnomusicology from the University of Washington uh, here in Seattle. Uh, he's now living in, in Yangon and uh, and and Myanmar. He's also the dean of the Git Mayet Music Institute in Yangon. Now, Git Mayet means uh, music and friendship. Uh, he began his piano studies with Umo Nayin, Wu Tet U, and uh, Kit Young in 2003. And Kit is also going to be joining us here. She's a pianist, composer, improviser. She lived in Myanmar from 2003 to 2008 with many trips before uh, to study Burmese Sandaya. Um, Together with various Burmese colleagues, she started the Get Me Up Music Institute in 2003. They're also working on digitizing Burmese 78 records on a grant from the State Department. And also, um, Nim Mo Yang is the uh, Myanmar representative for the Thai Annual Music Festival, C. Si ASEAN. I'm hoping I'm not mispronouncing that, but here we go. Welcome, Kit. 
welcome Nemil. Thanks for being here. There's a lot to cover, but uh, first off, um, I did some research prior to this, and uh, obviously for my show on KEXP, um, the upright piano was introduced by the British in the mid-1800s. One of you, please speak to that, the history of the instrument um, a bit. So the British brought in, uh, I mean, the pianos were in India, and this was Greater India, and uh, um, for churches, the British had some upright, small sort of um, harmonium-like keyboard instruments, and then also uh, would import pianos for churches in southern, what was called Anglo-Burma in the southern section. And then um, King Mindon in uh, Inwa, Mandalay area, uh, when he moved his palace to Mandalay, he was really curious about this instrument, and he instructed one of his ministers on a trip to uh, London to look for one. And, and so he knew about it. And then the Italian ambassador in 18, 1862 um, gave him a piano, an upright, and he he asked the music, palace musicians who were all uh, incredible virtuosi on on drums and gongs and uh, kettle gongs and um, xylophone, padla uh, in Burmese, to play it, to just use their techniques and their ear and their music. So an, uh, an incredible oral tradition uh, developed on this instrument. And um, in Burma, Many instruments like that have been adapted from other countries, other cultures, and Bur the Burmese sensibility about music making applied. Okay, and um, but it it there's something about it that I remember the first time I hearing that was like this is really interesting, but like a mystery. Like th I know this instrument, but it's being played in such a different way, and it's affecting me in a different kind of way. Kit, what brought you to to me to Myanmar in 2003? Uh, so, so in 2003, it was my husband who was working for the U.S. Embassy. He was posted there, but um, on a my my own trajectory started a long time ago when I was a child growing up in Thailand, and uh, my parents had a lot of Burmese friends, and I was familiar with Thai music and as a as a child, a teenager, and then was very curious about uh, Burmese piano, which I heard about from a musicologist who, well, he was a writer, Ukinzo, who was also a broadcaster at the Burmese Broadcasting Service in the 50s. And I talked to him, uh, I was there on a week trip in 1972, and he said, you know what, you might really be interested in our piano. Thank you, thank you for sharing that. Uh, Nimio, what brought you to your path to music and this particular instrument? I, I was grew up in a small township uh, next to India, it's called Tamu. And uh, since I was young, I was uh, surrounded by the music uh, from the monastery or from uh, all this religious community. So when I finished my high school, I, I came to Yangon and to study uh, music. Actually, my first uh, ambition is to study Burmese music. At the same time, I have you know, like uh, other many Burmese musicians or many young generation. I have kind of like mindset that. Western music is superior and very systematic. So that's why I decided to study Western classical music first. And then later, I switched to the administration music. Okay. Was there a moment when you realized, like, no, it's not superior? It's just different. Yeah, for like... sure. It's totally different. And still, I mean, now many people still believe, you know, not just Western music, classical music, or Western music, but also any other kinds of music. You know, you believe. Is, mm -hmm. uh, some kinds of music is superior to other kinds of music. So that's what we are trying to uh, get rid of uh, here. How is this music received in the country right now? Because it's traditional music and there's a lot of pressure, as you were saying, from Western music and culture. So how is it being perceived by people in the cities? And in the city, you know, there's uh, some you know, people who love this kind of music. But compared to, you know, like uh, popular music, it's not that much popular. But at the same time, if we compare to very classical uh, Burmese music, what we call Mahagita, so this kind of music is a little bit popular compared to very old pieces. You guys opened up the Git Mayet School, and was, so there's an opportunity there to have the generation that is, you know, coming up to discover this. And, you know, it's their legacy. It's, you know, you, you have this. Other types of forms are imported, but this is yours. Is there an attempt to to get the kids hip to this stuff? 
<laughs> that was the original intent. I mean, not exactly to do that, but to have access, right? So we would have older musicians um, just come to the school and sit and have tea and coffee and talk um, every day. And that that group of musicians was there for, so that younger musicians could see, but they were very interested, most of them, in um, learning skills of Western music so that they could play guitar, get gigs, you know. Um, sing, and um, that was important to them. Another consideration, which is uh, really central to, to Burma, to Myanmar, is there are many, many ethnic groups and languages and religions um, that are there. So in addition to the, Buddh the Buddhist majority um, in Yangon, there are a number of Hindus, Muslims, and, and a greater number of Christians who um, identify their musical taste with, with Western music from the time they're small singing in church. So for them, um, Burmese music is, it's fine, but it's sort of on the quaint side and it's not, they feel like that's not their music. Um, although, of course, they hear it all the time. So there is a, uh, there is a religious connotation to different musics that are going on and one religion won't listen to or play the other music? Nemyo, maybe you can talk about that. Uh, sort of, you know, like uh, if if you are, you know, the Buddhist, you know, you like someone like me. I grew up in the Buddhist community, so I was surrounded by you know all those you know traditional Burmese music and you know, related to Buddhist, mm -hmm. Buddhist you know, uh, Buddhism. And also like for like you know, some of my friends, like especially in my hometown, we have many Chin ethnic, so they are uh, listening to you know Christian music or some church music, choir singing. All those things, so they are more close to you know uh, those you know, Christianized uh, music, and yeah, uh, it depends on you know where you grew up. Oh, wow, it's so complicated. You also have a series of uh, of digitize, uh, digitizing uh, Burmese musical history, a collection of seventy eights that are now um, a legacy. Can you speak more about this this process? How did this come about, and where where this is right now? We both uh, we both started it in the American Embassy. The ambassador had something called the Ambassador uh, Preservation Cultural Preservation Project in 2008, which we applied for for Vietnamic and we were able to uh, fortunately get, which was a two 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 and then, then another grant, community service grant. So we had two projects that were simultaneous. One was digitizing um, old 78s and tape cassettes, and the other project was um, and it's still ongoing interviews with elderly performers, not just musicians, but performers all over Myanmar. So then I want to pass this on to Nemo because he's got the he's got the skinny on how we how we kind of came to do that. Please. I think in 2007, uh, one of the most famous Burmese uh, pianists uh, to whom or kept his study, uh, he passed away. So that's where we were really shocked. You know, like we thought that that's time we have to, to do it, this project. Uh, because the you know, people are dying, musicians, the performers yeah. are dying, and there is no one who will go to them and ask about their experience. You know, no one asks. We have we no great musician. They don't even leave any image or performance. So that's why we decided to do this, and we brought her from the embassy. You know, even though we, uh, especially for me, I have no prior experience at all about interviewing things, you know, archiving things. So, but uh, we just find our best. You know, Bit by bit, and we interview uh, over 30 uh, musicians and right now maybe over 50 uh, about their life, uh, uh, their experience. At the same time, we just uh, go around the country and collect uh, all those uh, uh, some big RPM records. Where where are these interviews? Where like what's the process of making these things available to people that would be interested in them? So we recorded with DV, a mini mm -hmm. DV tape, and now I still have those DV. And that uh, our camera doesn't work anymore, so we just keep waiting, you know, the time you know, to get those equipment and, and transferring all those things. Uh, right now, we we are using you know, deep, uh, digital format, so uh, I just put it all everything on my hard drive, and we just find it post on Facebook. That's really, really beautiful, and it's good work, um, and uh, it's powerful work. Uh, because you're preserving and sharing a culture. Myanmar's going to 21st century. We're all going to 21st century. So there's this legacy, you know, this music that your 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 particular choice of instrument was uh, introduced in 1850, and so we're now moving into you know the 21st century, fully in 21st century. I'm curious how this legacy is is 
is being perceived? Is it is there like a sense of like, yeah, this is us and we need this? Or is it like a curiosity? Sometimes you blame the young generation uh, for not being able, not being interested in their own music because those you know, musics are not around them and they cannot listen to it easily. Uh, they only hear you know, all those K-pop or pop or hip hop. Mm-hmm. That's around us. So it's, it's easier for them you know, to uh, keep in touch with those music, their genre and uh, fan with those music. But for traditional music, you did not find like that. But because of the popularity of Facebook right now, it's, it's reachable to everyone. And so uh, it's better access right now. That's why I chose the Facebook as a platform because the Facebook is kind of like the internet in Myanmar. So everyone uses it. So for mm-hmm. my, uh, my idea is you know, like, uh, yeah, we have to reach out and we have to you know, send uh, all this collection to all over the world. It's very important. Yeah. But at the same time, you know, like we are here and there's many people who have never listened to their own music. Why don't we do that first? It's much easier for me. That's why I, uh, we decided then to, to upload on Facebook and to share. So through them, you know, like if, if I know something, you know, they might have it. You know, they will download and they will listen to it. And uh, after that, you know, or maybe like at the same time, we can also reach to the outside of the country. I think you will. Um, there's the, the reason I brought up um, the young people of your own country because is that as I've been doing this program, I'm finding that certain musical traditions actually do help people. It's like there, 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 there's a um, you know there's a sacredness to it. There's a connection whether you believe in a higher power or nature or community. And certain and other musics just don't do that. They're ego driven. They're just like they, they don't have a connection to the legacy of the history of this. You know, I'm um, I am I grew up uh, in Poland, and anytime I hear old Polish village music, you know, it kind of affects me in a different way. It's not that I love it, like oh my god, I need it, but it's like wow, I remember this. There's a there's a I feel like a connection that's almost transcendent in that way, and I find that. Um, you know, my own children, like, I know you didn't grow up there, but this is your dad's stuff. You you have this heritage here. Listen to this because it can kind of help in the future. And if you lose it, you don't have it anymore. Like, you know, you had these, I'm going to be poetic right now. You had these wings that kind of lifted you up. But once the wings are gone, you're not going to, it doesn't work anymore. So I, anybody that's working in this space, I'm like, this is super important because you don't know what you lost until you've lost. You don't, you don't know what you had until you lost it. And um, and for a whole generation, this is really good and important, and it's going to affect you in a in a way that you don't even know right now. So thank you for doing it. For as somebody from uh, from Myanmar and carrying this tradition, but just as somebody who cares about the power of music, and for all of us out there continuing to do this work. So thank you. That's it. That's my speech. Wow, <laughs> that's great. Thank you. Um, Nimio, please be safe. Yeah as much as you can and uh, continue doing the good work um, and uh, we're going to watch some more music and um, and say goodbye right now so you be Thank well you. be safe take care Thank you.